Hey guys, Stealth here and welcome to the 1.09 update video. The game is now live updated to 1.09. No more betas of this version. So let's have a look, see what they added and see what sort of interesting things you can now do in the game. Let's get started with a new campaign because, sorry, with a loading campaign. Because this is new. You have five save slots. And this is a definite quality of life upgrade because previously you simply didn't have this. Wanted to start a new campaign? Well, tough. Your old campaign is going to get overwritten. So now we can actually use this to play different saves. And this is really quite nice. When I started the campaign that I'm loading into, I found that it took me seven minutes. And that was starting a US 1940s campaign. It does seem like the game takes a while to generate the, well, to generate quite a lot of stuff, actually. It hung around on March 1936, April 1936, and then once it sort of cleared that hurdle, it just burst right past it. This does make me wonder. Um, they did say in the patch notes we have fixed the issue where the AI ships were sort of outdated in the sense that the ships were, when you start a new campaign, all designed like four years before the campaign actually started. So in this case, 1936. That supposedly has been resolved. I'm not sure if it has, because it still kind of hangs at that point. Anyway, um, let's have a look at the full world map, because this is it. Um, if you want to move around this map fast, then um, either use scrolling with the mouse, but I found the arrow keys just to be a lot more comfortable and a lot more smooth. When it comes to the map, you got to keep in mind the globe is round and the game knows that, but is not intuitive about it. Because what you need to do is bring your ships right here to the edge of the map, then go all the way to the other side of the map. And once you're there, you can say, you know what, I want you to drop off the left side of the map and reappear on the right. So it's less than intuitive, but it does work. Now we have a bunch of new nations. We have China, we have Japan, we have Spain. And keep in mind that Spain has quite a few, let's say, outposts over here. Uh, we also have Russia and we have the Americans. Now the Americans, um, interesting group, interesting uh, faction because all of a sudden with this larger world map and I'd say it goes more for the US and Japan China to some extent than the rest of the nations, you're going to have to keep your fuel in mind. Operational range usually wasn't a thing. Yes, it supposedly got you some better missions, but in this situation, when let's say you're playing the US and you want to be fighting the Germans, uh, just to name something, if I want to send a ship, do I have a standard ship here? Yes, the Albany, good. Uh, if I want to send it over here to the Baltic, then just this bit is going to take me 5,000 kilometers. One way trip. Fortunately, your ships do get refueled when they're not actively doing anything. So it's like an oiler pulls alongside or something like that. And you do get your ships to be refueled. So it's not like you're going to be sitting in the middle of the Atlantic and going, oh crap, I'm out of fuel. You'll be fine. Now, um, the tech, the tech tree, it works. All the to do techs are now active. And this, for example, goes for the submarines. All sorts of submarines have been added and I'll get into that in a minute. But also things like maneuver warfare, naval communications, mines and underwater, uh, sorry, ASW and underwater acoustics. Let's look at maneuver warfare and naval comms for a bit, because these, for example, improve crew training. Crew training manages how accurate your ships are going to be, how effective they're going to be at range finding, but also how effective they're going to be at being able to fix damage that they have taken. So investing in things like maneuver warfare and to some extent also naval communications is really important. It is really going to make quite the difference in how quick your crew gets trained uh, and naval comms, no, sorry, naval comms not so much. Naval comms is more about some other parts. So they completely upgraded the tech tree and everything that used to be uh, to do has now been done and you have all of a sudden a lot more to research. 
because all of these additional blocks have appeared. Now let's have a look at mines. You can see them here in the tech tree. It allows mine laying equipment for destroyers and cruisers. You can sweep with torpedo boats and destroyers. Of course, at some point torpedo boats become obsolete and the job gets done by destroyers alone. Mine sweeping efficiency is a thing and mining effectiveness. So what sort of research can you expect? Well, you can go through all sorts of advanced mine techs. You can get mine hunter ships. You can get mine hunter kits. And once you have enough of these things researched, you can actually put them on a ship. You can use destroyers in uh, both an offensive and a defensive role, as they have said. And this means that this new module has appeared. Click to install. I can either install Mine Layer 1 all the way up to Mine Layer 5, Advanced Mine Layer 5. Uh, what 160 mine laying does, I don't know. I haven't really had the time to test all of this out yet. But it's, um, well, I suppose it is better than <laughs> Layer 1. So with Advanced Mines 5, you can start laying mines. Where can you put those? Around your ports. It's not like you can suddenly decide to mine the Suez Canal or put mines in the Panama Canal. Sadly not. Would lead to all sorts of fantastic situations, I suppose, but sadly not. If you are approaching an enemy port and you want to make sure that your precious battleships don't run into a mine, then the mine sweeper feature is going to be fairly important. So just sending out battleships, it used to work. It doesn't work anymore. Simply because something as big and clunky as a battleship is going to need a destroyer for more sensitive, smaller tasks like mine sweeping. You can get the Mine Hunter Kit 1 all the way up to the Mine Hunter Kit 5, and this is a 1941 campaign, so you might not have all the features listed here researched yet. This one, Mine Hunter 5, also works together with the ability to have sonar. At least I believe it does. Let me put down a tower. Here we go. Acoustics. Sonar. Um, oh, sorry. No, that's the submarine spotting. Submarine spotting. Never mind. So, yeah, you got Minehunter deployments, advanced mines, Minehunter kit, and do keep a few destroyers around your fleets. Especially if you are deciding that bombarding enemy ports or invading enemy ports is going to be important to you because you might run into a mine. Now let's move on to submarines. I'm going to go back into the main screen. You cannot design submarines, but you can determine what sort of a submarine you want built. So in the submarine tab, that's a new one, you can dictate that you want to build a new submarine. And again, this level of submarines or the amount of submarines that you see here is going to be heavily dependent on what sort of tech you have researched. You have submarine mine layers, these build in nine months. I'm not sure what these attack and stealth values really tell you. This thing deploys 60 mines. Okay, great. I'm not sure how many I need. Do I need 60? Do I need a thousand? I'm not sure. You got coastal submarines, you got ocean going submarines, cruisers, and even the super fleet submarine. Coming with six bow torpedo tubes, four stern torpedo tubes, a four inch gun, and advanced diesel electric engines. So, how do these things work? Um, you build them, and once you build them, you can tell them to go somewhere. Now, currently, I have found a bug, because if I want to build a submarine, here, watch this. If I go to world view, note the budget. I'm getting 429 million a month, right? 429 million a month. If I build a submarine, it's not costing me anything at the moment. This is a bug that you can, if you so desire, exploit at the moment. I can build 100 super fleet submarines. It's going to take me nine months to build each one of them. And um, it's going to cost me 541 million per month. Or is it? Because currently it is not. Nothing changes about the monthly balance. So the submarines currently are a little bugged. In game, they do work. Because in-game, for example, here I have a couple of uh, submarines. These are fleet submarines, I believe, the SC. They're moving from Portland. Nearest port is St. John's, and they are uh, they have a destination of Eastern North America. They're basically where I want them to be. You can see that this 
tab is all wrong because this is not an Eridano class battleship. And actually, I had expected things like this to be fixed. Like, why am I seeing that? Why am I seeing this? Why am I not seeing some sort of small overview of the submarine? Not that I can control it, but hey, at least would be nice. Anyway, you can have your submarine group. Um, they currently do not have any ammo because you cannot actually control them in conflict, but you can tell them where to go. So in a situation like this, um, I am at war with the Germans. There is a light cruiser from the Germans over here with a control radius of 101. It has minesweeping capability, but I don't know what its capability is when it comes to killing submarines. So what I can do is have this entire submarine group try and get into the path of the light cruiser and potentially damage it. Whether it's capable of sinking it, I don't know. What I do know is that submarines sadly cannot go on indefinitely. When it comes to my submarines, yeah, over here in Charleston, if I want to move my submarines, I can only do so within the radius that you see drawn here. So you are a little bit limited in your capabilities of sending submarines. That is, you're limited in your ability to send submarines when you're in the United States. If you are playing as Europe, um, <clears throat> let's say you are, oh, I don't know, you're the Brits. You can send a whole group of submarines out of Yarmouth and you can send them to go on the offensive around the German ports. And with that, you can make life on the German ships really quite difficult. So how do you get rid of these little submersible buggers? Well, you design your ships, such as a destroyer, to be capable of going on the offensive against them. I believe it starts at heavy cruisers. They have depth charges going again all the way up from tier 1 to tier 6 at this point, giving me a more uh, or a higher ASW effectiveness rating, meaning that my chance of dealing with the submarine effectively are good. If you want to further improve the capabilities of one of these ships against submarines, you're also going to need a sonar system. This gives you another 250% bonus to ASW effectiveness. And just how effective you need to be? I don't know. The game doesn't really do a good job of telling you. I do see that I have a 547 ASW rating. I don't know what that means. I don't know what sort of rating I mean or I need against the submarine. Do I need a rating greater than the submarine's stealth capabilities? Do I need a rating greater than... I don't know. It just doesn't say. This is something that I would like to have seen explained a little better in the patch notes because currently it just says, hey, we have submarines um, and your ships can deal with submarines. And I'm going, okay, but what sort of number should I be focusing on? And I simply currently don't know. The other thing that they've introduced is a recon rating. It represents the reconnaissance capabilities of the ship. So basically, how good are you at spotting stuff and potentially doing that without being detected? Because you also have a detectability radius and that is going to come into play when it's more of a tactical view, if you will, when you're in actual battle. The recon rating affected by technology as well as spotting, detectability and speed attributes of the ship. So let's play around with the recon rating a bit, shall we? If I add a radar then we're suddenly getting to 506 from 135. So having a radar massively helps. You really want to have a radar on your ships. It just does make them more expensive because I'm currently paying 25 million for this ship without a radar. And with a radar, I'm paying 34 million. So you could make the case for having a certain ship that is excellent at spotting, yet is potentially a bit cheaper. So you're not going to have all the latest tech when it comes to guns on it. Or you're not going to have the best engines or the best armor. More of a pick a chip, if you will. Now I believe this... Does this give you bonuses for ASW as well? Yes. I'm not sure why. Because I think that the reconnaissance rating and the ASW rating are somehow connected. Um, because... <sighs> 
Well, let's say a submarine is not always going to be submerged. But the tooltip for the rangefinder, radar rangefinder, does not say that it gives me a bonus to my ability to start spotting submarines. Yet, my ASW rating goes from 547 to 2742. I'm not sure if that means that this thing is now suddenly four or five times as good at detecting submarines. But for now, it seems to be a factor. And again, I don't know how much I can trust these numbers here. Something else that supposedly boosts your recon rating. Um, being tall, I imagine. So having a higher draft. What? Oh, it lowers my recon rating. Right. Because I am easier to detect. My target profile increases. So having a small ship means that you're harder to detect. And having a really fast ship to the tune of 48 knots means that your recon rating improves as well. Because you can cover more terrain quickly. So play around with these. Um, ideally, I would say go for this number. But I simply don't know. The game doesn't really explain that much. The game does say that large and slow ships are expected to have a smaller recon radius than cruisers and destroyers. So let's see. I have my battleship Nebraska. She is coming in at almost 85,000 tons. Her recon rating is 127. So she is extremely easy to detect, I suppose. But her ability to detect is not that good. If I were to build the fastest destroyer, that's going to be a boat that does what? 51, oh, it used to be 60 knots, 51, I already have a recon rating of 111. I'm going to make the ship really small, 114. And I'm going to put a radar on this. Not if I have such a narrow beam, however. Also, things like um, tower spotting, currently 3600, 3800, 4000, 4200. So you, if you want to have a spotter ship, let's say a dedicated spotter ship, the better it is at tower spotting, the more likely it is to be able to do its job to what exactly you want it to do. Here we go. Uh, recon rating is now 1079. If I add sonar, does that boost it? No, it just boosts my ASW rating. And if I use radio, it gives you a 90% reconnaissance bonus. Yeah, going up to 1268. So with a proper destroyer, well, let's say with an overpowered destroyer like the one that I'm getting here, you can get a really high recon rating, I think. Again, I don't know what the numbers are supposed to look like. We're just going to have to play the game a bit together and figure out what sort of numbers are normal, what sort of numbers you should be going for, and what sort of recon rating you want on your ships. Now, as we're in the shipyard anyway, what you can do in the shipyard as well is go for the biggest ships. And when you have the biggest ship, you're able to see the new dockyard. Previously, when you had the dockyard, the massive ships would sort of stick out the front and stick out the back. That's been fixed with this new dockyard, and I think it looks really nice. Um, it's, I think it's a bit too wide, but okay. Um, I mean, it gets the job done. If you want to have this massive ship, you could probably still be building slash docking another one on the other side of it. You might not be able to see this new dockyard until you have the biggest ships, because, for example, Modern Battleship 2 still fits in the old one. Which, I'm not sure if they've changed the size of it, because this is 85,000 tons, and it seems to fit really easily. So it does seem like they have changed the basic dock as well. Time to get back to the main map to show you something else that they have added. Fuel and ammo. If I have the USS Montana over here, you can see that she's currently using, or she still has, 83% of her fuel. She has 100% of her ammo. Normally, well, previously, in the previous version of the game, when you had a battle and you ended the battle, your ship survived. You might have been repairing it, I don't know. The ship survived. Um, the next battle, you instantly had a complete full load of ammunition. That's no longer a thing. And that means that your ammo does get slowly resupplied. But it's not like you're suddenly going to be going into battle with a full load of ammo. So pick your engagements wisely. If you're able to run, then potentially that's a better option right now. 
Because if you're running out of shells mid-battle, then, well, you'll have no other choice to run or to die. It is going to be um, more interesting to get a higher ammo loadout on your ships. So especially ships that go out very far might benefit from having an increased ammo load. The problem is when you do that, um, the game is going to go, yes, you can, but you're risking your ammunition exploding. You're getting a 25% debuff to your demo detonation chance. So, mm, do you really want to bring this much ammo? Or do you want to pick your engagements wisely and make sure that you're able to get back to port in time? Or to get resupplied? Again, resupplying, much like fuel, happens automatically. It depends on how far away you are from a port. So, ideally, just do a couple of battles and go back to a port. And again, I think this is going to be more... Well, potentially more of an issue for the Americans and the Japanese and the Chinese than it is for the European factions. Because the Europeans are generally not operating too far from home. Well, unless you're France and you're picking a fight with the Japanese, for example. But generally, Europe tends to fight each other. France versus Germany, Germany versus the Brits. I'm not sure who the Russians are going to be fighting. I mean, they have to be fighting the Japanese at some point just to make sure that we can have the whole Kamchatka event. But um, anyway, increased ammo shells could be an option, but beware that you might find your ship violently exploding. Another feature they have added is the recommission time when it comes to getting a ship out of mothballs. Let's say you have a peaceful period you put a couple of your ships in mothballs to make sure you don't spend that much money on it. The uh, California over here is costing me 2.7 million a month. I don't like that. I'm going to put it in mothballs. That means it is only costing me 820,000 a month. So you're, spa you're saving quite a bit. But a ship like this cannot suddenly be put back into service. If you're going to go and put the ship back to full crew, it takes two months for the ship to be ready again. I think this is a good mechanic. I just would have implemented it a bit different because this sort of implies that I decide on Monday I want to commission the ship or I want to put in mothballs and Tuesday I go, no, actually I don't. It's not like the whole crew would have forgotten what to do with California. They wouldn't suddenly have forgotten how to do their jobs. But in a situation as the game is right now, it's like they suddenly need two months of training time to come back up to their previous levels. If you think you might be clever and go, you know what? I'm going to put the ship to absolute minimum crew. Let's say I can get one guy. Yeah. I can get one guy. One guy to keep control of this ship. The Huron. <clears throat> right. If I then want to use the ship... Uh, you get a bit of a penalty because it's not like one guy can do the entire maintenance on this cruiser. So you're going to spend eight months repairing the ship before it's going to be able to go out and deal with the enemy again. So be very careful about minimizing crew and or mothballing because the bigger the ship is, the more time it takes, such as with the North Carolina it's a Nebraska-class battleship, and it takes four months to recommission it. If you're suddenly finding yourself in a war, and you suddenly need to recommission all of your ships, you might take many months, during which you'll be extremely vulnerable. So be very careful how many ships you mothball, because you suddenly won't have their availability back, much like you did in the previous version of the game. Another feature that was added in 1.09 is shell splashes interfering with each other. Now, when a battleship is engaging something else, it is going to throw out a lot of shells. The gun directors, if you will, figure out which splash is theirs, and then based on that, they adjust their guns. So they might change the elevation, they might change the angle, and with that, they then try again to put a shell on target. The problem is, if you have a lot of guns, you don't know what shells are yours. So you don't know what adjustments to make. 
And this now means that having a lot of ships fire at the same target, you're exacerbating this problem. So you don't know if the shells that just splashed around the target were yours or those of your five sister ships, which also happen to be pummeling that one battleship that you're facing. Keep this in mind as you pick your rangefinder, because the rangefinder now takes this into account. The coincidence rangefinder gets 110% gun aiming speed and a bit more gun base accuracy, but the stereoscopic does not get such bonuses, but it does mean that your shell splash interference from your own guns and other guns are substantially reduced. So you negate this negative effects on your accuracy and you're able to once again accurately lay into the target. Keep this in mind because for shorter range ships, a coincidence rangefinder might be a lot better. But if you have a lot of them, then all of your ships could sort of start competing with each other and work against each other, which again goes against the effectiveness of your fleet. You can of course circumvent this by having your ships target different ships. The problem is if you are dealing with an encounter of let's say 10 versus 10 ships, this is going to be micromanagement hell. It's not going to be fun. It's going to take you a lot of time to dictate, hey, uh, ship A, I want you to engage target one. Ship B, target two. Ship C, target three. It's not easy. Um, I do like the mechanic. I think it adds to the game. Whether it's going to be easy to use, hmm, hard to say. I'd say if you want easy to use, just pick stereoscopic rangefinders every time. Um, they are heavier, they are more expensive. Your, let's say, my main tower goes from 158 to 171, or 170, oh, it's 2 million. <clears throat> On a ship this big, I would probably pick stereoscopic. Just get the best stuff. Make sure you don't worry about the splash mechanic, because especially with these big guns, I want them to land their shells. And, well, these aren't even that big, but if I put a 20 on it, I don't know, a triple 20, these things reload in 190 seconds. I don't want them to be wasted, these shells. So pick the right rangefinder. The next mechanic is a bit difficult to visually display because it has to do with recoil. If you put massive guns on a small hull, it's going to cause a lot of recoil and that sort of causes the ship to roll over. Of course, the more the ship does that, the more difficult it'll be to get the next shell to land accurately. The game, however, doesn't signify anywhere in the list that I've been able to find what the recoil stat is, how much, let's say, mass you need on your ship to make sure that recoil is not a thing. It doesn't say so when you look at the tooltip of the gun. It doesn't say so on the right-hand side. Um, I don't quite know how to make use of this. What I understand what they're going for is, mm, let's say having a really sleek battlecruiser hull that fires its 15-inch guns? Huh, you used to be able to put bigger guns on these things. Um, that fires, let's say, 20-inch guns over the side. Like, you have, I don't know, you're going to need a main tower, but if this thing with a narrow beam fires over the side, it just kind of rolls back. That recoil mechanic means you're going to have less accuracy. So this is a way, and I'm not sure I really like it because it takes away from the game element. It forces you to have a more reasonable relationship between the tonnage of your ship and the size of the guns. If one is too big or the other is too small, so if your guns are too big or your hull is too small, you're going to find that recoil could be a problem. Now we're going to stick with the Oklahoma for a second here, this new uh, battlecruiser, because what I can show you is engine efficiency. They have changed this in a way that it now means you can go above 100% engine efficiency. Let's say I want to have gas turbines on this ship, uh, oil, actually no, gear turbines, easier to use. Gear turbines too, I'm going to go with forced boilers. I have a 106% engine efficiency, so you can now go above 100%. Cool, why would you want to? 
Well, having a higher engine efficiency, and if I can actually find the stat here, it's going to give you more acceleration, more torque, also more operational range and more cruising speed. Cruising speed is how fast a ship is going to get to the target on the world map, as far as I understand it. So having a higher cruising speed is definitely helpful because it means your ships can zip about the main strategic map a lot faster. So if I add another funnel, then my engine efficiency has gone up to 168 and my cruising speed is now 19.4 as opposed to 18.7. You can also see the operational range here, 21,971, goes up to 27,953. This can, of course, be somewhat exploited. Because if you just put a load of funnels on a ship, and I'm going to go and make this just a mockery, uh, I'm going to go to 300% engine efficiency. Does this make sense? No. Does it mean you can transit the globe? Uh, yes, quite. You, well, you're almost there. If I, if I take diesels, does that work? Yeah, I can now circumnavigate the Earth. You need 44,000 kilometers to do that. This ship has 48,000 kilometer range. The engine efficiency does seem to be capped at 300%. Wow, we're actually gaining range. Yeah, so I would need like one extra funnel. There. This also means you have a 188% acceleration bonus. Uh, your operational range gains a lot and your cruising speed is now 24.8 with a top speed of 28.5. If you were to boost this to max, you would have a cruise speed of 39.4. Of course, this is not a ship you would actually build. Well, maybe I would in the campaign, just because. But um, keep your engine efficiency in mind. It is going to be important. Speaking of engines, smoke interference is now working different. It is no longer a permanent factor, but it takes the wind in a battle into account. So if you have the wind at a favorable angle, then smoke interference is not really going to be a thing for you. It does not matter that much for your own accuracy. This means that jockeying for position with other ships might be a lot more interesting. Because you might be able to sort of offensively use your smoke to make their accuracy worse. The same can be said for smoke screens that destroyers can lay. Your destroyers can put smoke screens up and if you put them well, it might just help your fleet out. If you put them wrong, it might help the enemy fleet out. Again, keep an eye on the wind because if you put them out wrong, well, maybe it would have been better not to deploy the smoke screen anyway. Moving on to armor. Normally you would have, let's say, um, armor... In, oh, actually, let's be, uh, show this first. You had Crib 4. That was the highest. Now we also have Modern Armor 1. Really expensive. Really expensive. Crib 3 gives you 300% armor cost. This gives you 950% armor cost. So keep that in mind. It's going to make it a lot more expensive. But the point I was going to make was you can change the amount of armor here and it would just always be 15 inches. It would just always be 15 inches of armor belt. But that is no longer true because armor can be damaged. And it sort of ablates in that sense. If a shell plating, let's say somewhere in the, the citadel, constantly gets battered, it's going to give up at some point. It's going to get weakened. So even the biggest ships with the most armor can start to go down simply because their armor is, well... It's been destroyed, it's been damaged, it's been weakened. And that then gives you an opportunity to completely destroy the ship after all. So these ships that you used to be able to make with, I don't know, 40 inches of armor. Um, well, you can actually do that, but something to that effect. Let's say the Turingias that I had in the Big Guns campaign. Um, they were cruisers that had a very small citadel with a lot of armor. Almost unsinkable. Almost unsinkable. That's no longer possible. You can still build that design. You can still try and use that ship. But the problem now lies in the fact that that armor will take damage. And as the armor takes damage, it becomes less effective. So armor weakens. Keep that in mind. 
As both armor and the ship weaken, if they take structural integrity damage, then anti-flooding becomes a lot more important. A ship that's been badly damaged is going to have much more of a difficult time trying to stay afloat. Controlling your flooding will be harder. So I basically always used to take reinforced bulkheads too. Sometimes triple hull bottom because it also gives you more resistance. It doesn't necessarily add to float. But anti-flood 3 and reinforced bulkheads as well as maximum bulkheads. I'd say these are now mandatory. You really don't want your ship to flood. It's generally not great for your ship because it tends to make them die. It tends to make them sink. So the more damage a ship takes, the harder it is now to contain your flooding. And with that, maybe better to be a bit more conservative with your ships, pull them out of the fight earlier and make sure that they get repaired so they can fight another day. When it comes to campaign ships, they now also have another issue. Flaws. A ship flaw is something that kind of went wrong in construction and they stick with the ship. If I look at the North Carolina, it has quite a few flaws. The ship is actually underweight. I'm not sure what that does, but I imagine it ties into the recoil. Its gun base accuracy is lower because it has some weapon defects. It gets a bigger penalty from sea waves. A gun aiming speed reduced, reverse speed reduced, flash fire chance improves, so that's not good. Flash fire spreading chance and shell rounds. I simply get fewer shells because this ship was built too small, I guess? Some other ships don't have this. The Nebraska doesn't have it. It seems to be fairly random and it is something that you can sort of steer when you're looking at a hull construction. This research gives you less and less and less ship flaws. I think adding ship flaws is interesting because it can add certain modifiers to your ships. Um, it seems that most of my battleships are underweight. That's weird. These cruisers, for example, don't have the issue. But California does. She's overweight. That's interesting. It's one of the few Americans that's overweight in this game. Look at this, the Huron. Tons and tons of hull defects. Boiler weight, fuel efficiency, turning rate, water pumping, chance of fire, ship. Holy crap. What happened to you? See, this is some sort of ugly duckling that I would probably not refit if it comes to that. I'd probably just scrap it because it comes with so many defects that I really don't want this thing in my fleet. Thank you very much. Not interested. I don't want this ship in my fleet. It's too... No. Anyway, keep an eye on hull flaws. Or on, on flaws on the ship. Um, <clears throat> how can you keep an eye on these? Well, the game tells you. The game tells you what sort of flaws you might be expecting. If I look at a basic geared turbines 2, it gives me 5% ship flaws. This is 5%, this is 7.5%, gas turbines is 10%. That is not necessarily going to do me any favors. The same can be said for going with more modern gear, like ship flaws increase with modern armor. Torpedo blistering... Oh, torpedo blister now goes up to anti-torp... No, sorry, it was already anti-torp 5. Uh, this does not give you any flaws. Citadel, 10% ship flaws for all or nothing citadel. Anti-flood doesn't give you any issues. Radar does not give you any issues. Interesting. You'd think that's something like a radar. Something could go wrong there, but okay. Rangefinder, not a problem. So some of these things cause more issues than others. Basically, the more advanced your gear is, the more likely it is to cause issues, to cause ship flaws. The more you stack ship flaws, the more you risk your ship not doing or not coming out of the dockyard as you had envisioned it. Because your crews, your dock workers, are simply not up to snuff. They simply cannot build that level of ship yet. So invest in that research. Invest in hull construction. Because it means you're just negating all of these hull flaws. And making sure your ships do come out the way that you had intended them. 
don't skimp on hull construction. Not in the least because it also reduces your ship construction time. Final thing on this patch is gun length. Now it depends on the tech level. I think this is another thing that they still need to flesh out a bit more because on this hull, I have a 13 inch turret with maximum barrel length plus 20%. I have a quad 20 inch, maximum barrel length 20%. But my two inch guns cannot go beyond 16% because they haven't been properly researched. So something as, I don't know, as fragile as this, I guess, cannot be lengthened that far. The three incher and seemingly everything else above can. This is something that you gain by research. The more research you do into metallurgy, uh, or metallurgy, I'm not really sure how to pronounce that, the more your barrels can be lengthened. And that, of course, comes with a bonus to your accuracy. Let's see what research that is. Uh, is that turrets? Big guns? No. Turret mechanisms? Yeah, here we go. Turret mechanisms is what you want. Casemate girl, uh, casemate barrel length plus ten percent, nine percent, eight percent, six percent, four percent. So you're gonna have to research this, especially if you're starting earlier. All of these things are going to be important. So what do you prioritize in the research tree? Um, that depends entirely up to you. Do you want to harass the enemy with submarines? Go for submarine research. Do you want to prevent? Getting mined, for example, go with um, mining and ASW sweeping tech. Make sure that your hull construction is up to snuff, because otherwise your expensive new ships come out like, well, not quite like what you wanted them to be. And um, things like engine efficiency, engines in general, are also a thing. I didn't cover this yet, but engine vibrations now give you a small debuff when it comes to firing your guns. So an engine, let's see. One of these things, yeah, I, I do see it here. You get less of a debuff from engine vibrations. If you have, let's say, a really powerful engine in a hull that's not quite designed to handle that hull or to that engine, you're gonna find that your hull is vibrating too much, like an overpowered, super fast destroyer. It's engine is going to be rumbling so much, your guns are probably going to have a pretty nasty debuff to firing. So keep in mind that you might want to have a ship that's not, not excessive. I don't really like that they're steering this way because they're. it seems like the devs are constantly pushing for more and more and more realism. Whereas there are clearly a lot of things that are not realistic about this game. And well, it says it right there. It's a game. I think something like this, yes, it adds to the game. It also takes away something because you could use um, really fast battle cruisers with a lot of big guns, and it used to be fun, especially in the Italian campaign. The Regina fantastic battle cruiser back then, I doubt it would work nearly as well now. Right, that concludes the video. I believe I covered all the main points for 1.09. Um, I'll definitely be looking further into the game and I might start up a series soon. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Good luck on your naval encounters with the enemy and I'll see you soon for more videos.